Hey yo, it's Tobin. I just finished giving a talk to the North Carolina Arc Info Users Group about open source software and local government. And let me just give a some mad props to the North Carolina Arc Info Users Group. They just put on a two hour online symposium with four great speakers. Well, I was there too, so there are four of us. So we'll say three great speakers on open source software and just mad props for being such open-minded professionals. You would never see the Oracle users group giving a two hour symposium on Postgres. So mad props to those folks. Their, their North Carolina Arc Info users group is great. This was an online talk and some things to know about online talks if you haven't given them before is that they're hard. It's different from giving a talk in front of an audience, which is actually, you might think it's harder. It's actually easier. When you're in front of an audience, you can gauge their reactions, engage the room. When I give a talk in front of a crowd, I usually memorize the first two sentences I want to say. And I mean, I memorize them like if I were parkouring across the rooftops with under sniper fire, I could get those two sentences out. Then everything else, I'm just reacting to the room. And I think that's what makes a great talk. Well, in an unlike talk, there's no room. So if you try to give a talk like you give in front of an audience to an online talk, you tends to be a really weirdly paced thing. So for online talks, I've learned I script the entire thing out, which I normally never do. I like everything I'm going to say. So if it sounds like I'm reading, it's because I am. Uh, that's about it. That's I think that's all I tell. Other, uh, I'll just I'll just give uh, WebEx a shout out for sucking. I I don't get how there's still a thing. I I'll save that for the end, so you won't have to hear my WebEx whining uh, at the beginning. I'll do the doc, and then I'll talk about WebEx because my God. All right, let's do this. Hi, I'm Tobin. I work with computers. If you've seen any of my talks before, you'd know I tend to go nerd in my talks, like hard nerd, full frontal nerd. And those talks are a lot of fun, mostly for me. This isn't going to be one of those talks. There will be no furious scribbling of GitHub URLs today, at least not until the very end. So take a deep breath and relax. This talk is mostly going to be about decisions and how human beings go about making them. After all, using software, whether it's proprietary or open source, is a decision. It's a choice you make. Although I am extremely youthful and vigorous in appearance, I've been working with computers for a long time. I've been in GIS for over two decades, and I've been working with open source software for probably the last 15 years. That's a long time. Over the course of my career, I've become fascinated with how people choose the tools they use. I've come to believe that they're generally not chosen on technical merits, and how people make decisions is the primary factor and the tools they choose, and whether or not they use open source software. We arrive at GIS from different places. Some of us are geographers, some of us are earth scientists, some of us are computer scientists, some come from other fields, some of us got here through sheer grit and stubbornness, and maybe some bad decisions. But all of us share something in common. We use technology to try and solve problems, spatial problems in particular. That makes us all technologists, or at least we start out that way. Here's something I think we can all agree on. Different problems often require different tools. That's not controversial. Here's something else we can probably agree on. Sometimes those tools will be proprietary and sometimes they'll be open source. I don't think any of us would find anything controversial in those statements seems like the most logical thing in the world. So how do we end up here? 
We all just agree that different problems require different tools. Why are a lot of us trying to drive screws with a hammer? If you're doing this, don't feel bad. It's not your fault. You may not even be aware that you're doing it. The human brain is an amazing thing, but it's far from perfect. In some ways, your brain is hardwired to trick you into doing things that are against your best interest. Take meetings, for example. You ever walk out of a meeting and say, boy, I'm glad that happened? Probably not. Of all the ways your brain will trick you into using the wrong tool for a particular job, two things stand out the most. I can probably tell you why you use the tools you use or do the things you do in a particular way. Perhaps not, but probably. If you ask questions about business practices, you'll fairly quickly run into the most dangerous phrase ever uttered by an organization. And it goes like this. We've always done it that way. Logic is as simple as it is pernicious. We use this tool because yesterday we used this tool. That's it. In psychology and philosophy, this is referred to as the inertia fallacy or default bias. You can think of it as a habit. Your mind is a habit-making machine. Habits afford predictability, and predictability puts the mind at ease. This kind of thinking is the progenitor of many failed businesses, and it also prevents you from trying different tools. If you've developed the habit of grabbing a hammer, when a screw comes along, your first instinct will be to grab that hammer and to beat the crap out of it. You want to know how casinos take all of your money? Loss. Loss is a powerful thing. The 1980s psychologists Amos Versky and Daniel Kahneman discovered there's an imbalance between loss and gain in the brain. Human beings, on average, weigh loss twice as much as gain. And that makes sense. Organisms that place more urgency on avoiding threats live longer than organisms that place more urgency on maximizing opportunities. This makes the prospect of loss a more powerful motivator on your behavior than the promise of gains. And that's how the casino gets you. Even though you only lost a little bit of money at the table, and you know the odds are if you keep sitting there, you're going to lose even more money, you keep throwing money at the problem because the original loss means more to you. You feel like you passed the point of no return. In psychology, this is referred to as the sunk cost fallacy. You may hear it called the Concord fallacy. Cost is the operative word, and it isn't only counted in money. The longer you wait in a line, the greater the odds you'll keep waiting in that line. The sunk cost fallacy leads us away from trying new things. The gains of a new tool aren't given the same weight as the loss of using your old tool. You're more invested in that hammer. The more invested you are in that hammer, the more you'll feel the need to pick that hammer up and start bashing screws with it. So you keep sinking, even though using the right tool for the job without fail will cost less in the long run. If our brains are hardwired to lead us to bad decisions, how do we fight that? I don't know. I'm not a psychologist. I struggle with these things as much as anybody else. And this isn't a problem just with folks that, folks that use proprietary software. It's a problem for everyone. But I do have some advice. My advice is this. Pause. The inertia fallacy and the sunk cost fallacy are wired to the fast reacting part of your brain, to the instinctual part. When a problem hits your desk, your hand immediately flies toward your mouse. The next time that happens, pause. Back away from your mouth slowly, grab a cup of coffee, and think about it. You don't have to become a monk to rewire your brain. You just need a little extra time to think. Here's an example of one of our sites. This is GeoPortal. It's named GeoPortal because we're not creative people. Uh, it is meant to answer the most common questions that our citizens may have. The site needs to service. It averages about 20,000 people a month. But it can spike up to 200,000 people a month when, say, trash collection day changes or school assignments change. It needs to be extremely fast and reliable and easy to use, particularly on mobile devices. 
Now, how do we go about thinking about building a site like this? You can think of apps as having three parts, back-end parts, front-end parts, and the tools developers need to make it. When an app's needs start with words like fast and scalable, it tends to nudge us toward our open source back-end tools. I've been an Esri software user for decades, and I give them a hard, hard time sometimes, well, often, okay, all the time, but it's out of a deep place of like. Uh, Esri tools have many, many exemplary, wonderful qualities to them, and they're absolutely useful, and we absolutely use them. But fast isn't among those qualities. Now, if that surprises you, if, if you haven't used software that isn't made by Esri, try quite literally anything else. But I'll warn you, the next time you're waiting for ArcMap to load, it'll make you quite angry. We went with Postgres and PostGIS for a data store and a simple vector tile server. By simple, I mean it's about 40 lines of code. And a PostGIS API we wrote ourselves and released as open source software. That handles the maps and all the spatial queries, like is my house going to be underwater the next time it rains? These tools are supremely reliable. We've had zero unplanned downtime for PostGIS in over two years. Now for the front end, it's hard to find front end tooling that isn't open source. You may or may not be aware of it, but the front end tooling used for the web for Esri is probably open source. They're either using Dojo or stuff they've open sourced themselves. It's hard to do the front end without using open source. Because this app does so many different things, a reactive component framework made the most sense. And that's nerd talk. All that means is the web page is chopped into little, little independent pieces. Those little independent pieces can handle state changes. Like if you update the data, that little table in the right hand corner will just automatically update itself. Now we use Vue.js to make isolated testable well, reactive components. For the map, we use Mapbox GLJS, and that uses vector tiles. Vector tiles are the future that's here right now and it cuts traffic over the wire down drastically. Developer tooling. It's hard to develop anything without developer tooling. Our snazzy graphics are generally made via Inkscape, which is a vector graphics editor. Because the native file type in Inkscape is SVG and your browser can render SVG, there's no extra conversion steps required. We also use Visual Code Studio, an open source code editor from, believe it or not, Microsoft. Uh, one important thing about all these tools is they're cross-platform. So when I'm in our Charlotte office running Windows, it runs fine. And when I'm at home on my home office in my Linux machine, it runs fine. Now, that was just kind of the big hitters. But there's a lot of open source software in GeoPortal. Uh, here's all the open source tools I could think of and were in my package file, but there's probably others I've forgotten. It reminds me of a lecture by the famous physicist Bertrand Russell that probably never happened, but it's attributed to him. Where after a lecture, someone stands up in the back of the room and says, what you've told us is rubbish. The world is really a flat plate supported on the back of a giant tortoise. It wasn't Shaquille O'Neal who asked this, by the way. It was someone else. The scientist gave a superior smile before replying, What is the tortoise standing on? You're very clever, young man. Very clever, said the person asking the question. But it's turtles all the way down. In open source software, it's packages all the way down. Hundreds of little tools that are combined in different ways to help solve your problem. Because they're small and generally single-purposed, they're reliable and fast. The result is a site that loads in about a second on the desktop and around four seconds on a 3G mobile device. It's about one-eighth the size of your average website in 2016. So this site that does this mapping and reporting and everything else is one eighth of your average website. By way of comparison, and I'll pick on ourselves here, charmac.org's homepage uses 4.8 megabytes and takes 54 seconds to load over 3G. 
and it doesn't do anything. It's really just a bunch of links. Thank you, SharePoint. We don't use open source software for every app we make. Sometimes it's all proprietary. Most often it's a mix. That isn't the important part. The important part is to ask the question, why are we doing it this way and is there a way that's better? Every project should begin and end with that question. That's what separates a technologist from a technician. Your brain wants you to trick you into becoming a technician. Don't allow it to do that. There are lots of great reasons to use open source software. I won't bore you with them. You can Google top 10 reasons to use open source software to your heart's content. But these are mine. Open source software innovates faster. And as a technologist, that's great. One of the things I love the most about being a technologist is learning new things and being on the cutting edge and trying new great and interesting things and solving problems with them. Open source is a community-based development model where you get to help other people and other people get to help you. As a software developer, I have to say software development isn't all science no matter what they'll try to tell you. There's an artistic aspect to it. It's an act of creation. As a painter wants their work to be seen, and a writer wants their work to be read, and a singer wants their work to be heard, the software engineer wants their work to be used. Sharing your code with the world is the best way to make that happen. I've contributed code to Mapbox GLJS, which is used by millions of people to make up a number. I don't know, it's probably millions. You Esri folks will be using it too, because you're going to be using Mapbox GLJS to draw your vector tiles. It's not a big amount of code I put in there, but it's code I put in there being used by all these folks. We've released our own open source software that's helped a lot of people. That's amazing. Using, contributing to, and creating open source software has been one of the most fulfilling experiences of my life. And that's coming from a software engineer who, let's be real, is probably mostly dead inside. I'm not telling you you should be using open source software. I'm not telling you you should be using propriety software. I don't know you. I don't know what prime kinds of problems you're trying to solve. Maybe you shouldn't be using open source software. What I want you to take away from this talk is a desire to ask the question. Asking the question is what makes us technologists. And isn't that why we all came here in the first place? If nothing else, you'll learn something new and you'll probably have a lot of fun doing it. And that was the talk. Told you it wasn't very nerdy. It's very not like my usual thing. Uh, the, in case you're just new to this YouTube channel, uh, that's my Twitter handle and my blog. And at the bottom there is where I keep my GitHub toys. And that includes GeoPortal that we just looked like and the tile server we use and the PostGIS API we created as well. All out there, all open source. Uh, pull requests are welcome. That was the talk. Uh, what was I oh, WebEx. God, WebEx sucks. So, I uh, I go to try it on Linux, figuring this is never going to work. And by golly, I went to a WebEx test page, and it said, you're downloading a web servlet in Java. And I was like, I don't have a fax machine to run that on. What am I supposed to do with this? So I found this iced tea Java servlet something on my machine. I don't know why it's there. So I run the servlet and half the stuff works and half stuff doesn't. Screen sharing doesn't work. That may be because I'm using NVIDIA proprietary drivers on my Linux machine. So I pull up my Surface Pro. Okay, I'll try it on this. So I pull up the Surface Pro and it asked me to install a Chrome app. And when it does that, it pulls up the screen saying, click here to install this Chrome app. And it has a picture of the Chrome app icon from the App Store with two stars next to it out of five for their own thing. They put the thing with two star marketing, marketing. So I put that on there, figured, oh, what the hell? And then that 
mostly works. I can scare, share the screen, but you know, people need to need to hear my sultry voice. I was like, how do I get a microphone on this thing? I, I don't see it. Turns out, to hear me, you have to go on the WebEx client and have the WebEx client call your phone. And then it calls your phone, and then that phone connects with the WebEx server, and then that's how they hear you. So now I've got a Service Pro over here with a slideshow on at WebEx, and I've got my Blue Yeti microphone plugged into my Lynx machine, which called up the WebEx server, and I've got mouses over here and keyboards over there, and that's why I couldn't record doing this live. Now, anyway, WebEx, I don't get it. How is that still a thing? I don't know. I think that's all I wanted to tell you. Uh, feel free to use this talk any way you want, and I will catch you later. Bye-bye.